Top Bed Talk. Monty Mython here. As we prepare to move into the next phase of the COVID crisis, we're going to be widening our focus here on Top Bed Talk. We will continue to deliver COVID-specific programmes, but we all have a huge additional responsibility as we try to reboot normal services. So although this piece is not directly related to COVID-19, we believe it's information that is crucial to the bigger task of rebuilding the healthcare system as we learn to adapt and live with this new virus. Thank you to our sponsors and to you, our listeners, for helping us to share this important information. Nick Majerison here. This piece is taken from the American Association of Nurse Anaesthetists Annual Conference last year. Don't forget, of course, the AA and A 2020 Annual Conference at the San Diego Convention Center still has tickets available. Don't forget to check out aaandacom forward slash meetings for more details. That's aaandacom forward slash meetings. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Well, hello, I'm Desiree Chapel, and this is Top Med Talk. We are coming to you from the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists 2019 Annual Congress in Chicago, Illinois. The AANA 2019 is a gathering of over 3,000 certified registered nurse anesthetists, or CRNAs, for the largest networking and educational event in nurse anesthesia. Now, over the course of the next three days, Top Med Talk is going to be sitting down with presenters, AANA leadership, and delegates to discuss hot topics in the CRNA community and anesthesia practice in general. And as always, I'm joined by Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk, Monty Mythen. Hello, Monty. Hey, Desiree. Great to be here. Um, our topic for discussion uh, this morning is caring for the transgender patient. And we had the privilege to sit down with a member of the ANA's Diversity and Inclusion Committee, um, Jose Castillo. Now, Jose authored a two-part series recently in the ANA uh, News Bulletin, Caring for the Transgender Patient. Um, Jose, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning, Desiree. Thank you for having me and getting this word out for everyone so that we can talk about a topic that's always been pushed under the rug. Yeah, absolutely. It has. We're, well, we, when we saw the topic, I um, kind of at first wasn't for sure what we were going to be discussing. And then I read your articles and um, saw that it was really how we as anesthesia providers can be more sensitive to the topic of um, taking care of uh, the transgender patient within the scope of perioperative care. Um, so, Jose, just give us a little bit about your background, where you're from, what you're doing right now in your own personal practice. Yeah, I am a full-time assistant professor at Texas Wesleyan University, and but I still live in Naples, Florida, and I practice clinically there also. Um, I have been involved with the ANA for the past, I don't know, since 2005 when I started. <laughs> I got enthralled with everything that they're doing, and I absolutely love anesthesia. So, But yeah. the reason I came into the topic of the transgender is because our little town of Naples, Florida is a little bit sheltered from the world. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but... Um, in the past 12 years of my practice, I only came across three transgender individuals, and it was a challenge, and it was kind of disheartening to see people talk and whisper, yeah. and I thought that we can do better. Yeah. As anesthesia providers, we should not look at people regarding of their choices and their beliefs and their actions about themselves, but we need to treat the individual that is in front of us. And that's what sparked this interest, and then when I got more involved with the AANA Diversity and Inclusion Committee, that's when I'm like, we need to do more. We need to present this topic. We need to expand our horizon. We need to educate our providers so that all of us will be on the same page with best practices for the care of transgender patients. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, In practice now, we're seeing um, that uh, transgender patients a lot more, not necessarily just for having surgery themselves um, in their transformation, but also just taking care of patients on a routine basis. And um, so you can see those patients all over the the country. So, Monty, um, you've had a little bit of experience. Well, uh, uh, where I work in the United Kingdom at University College London is one of the major andrology centers in the United Kingdom. So colleagues I work with have been doing gender reassignment surgery and all of the support services that go with that for decades now. So we are very familiar uh, with caring for transgender people, uh, both through the transition from one sex to another, but also after that. And as a result of that, also, we attract quite a lot of transgender members of staff because, because we've been there for a long time. They're very comfortable working with us. But when we were preparing for this last night, I discussed the fact that uh, gender reassignment is a mainstream um, treatment that's available on the National Health Service. So mm-hmm. our National Health Service has um, made a decision a, a good time ago now to say that as this is a condition, 
you know, when you badge it as a disease that makes it sound as though it's a problem in some way, but it's not. It's a condition. It's not a lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to provide appropriate services to allow people to make transition from their physical appearance to their emotional and hormonal state is is mainstream treatment. Yeah. So, um, Jose, can you start us off and just give us a little bit of background about um, maybe how, you know, the percentage of patients that we're taking care of now? um, Do you have that information? Yeah, I have a little bit of demographic information, but this is available from 2018. Um, This is from Newport. Like in 2012, there are 3.5 um, percent of American adults who self-identified as transgender. And then in 2016, there were 4.1 percent. And in 2017, it's 4.5 percent. Um, the World Professional Association of for Transgender Health also published their standards of care in 2017, and they have identified 1.4 million Americans who are transgender. So they are, they are individuals, members of the LBGT QIA community that is around us and that would need care not only for sex reassignment surgery and what I have encountered for endoscopies, EGDs, Mm -hmm. colonoscopies, appendectomies. Um, They need to see their primary care um, providers and other clinicians. They need to go to their physical therapists, their occupational therapists. And the challenge lies not only with us, with anesthesia providers, it's all encompassing because of there's going to be mistrust and some people get refused care and get marginalized and discriminated so they don't go back. Mm. Mm. So that's a big issue outside of anesthesia. So I think that there are published articles out there about case scenarios and essays talking about like it needs to start from the security guard, the policy should trickle down to the secretary, having to use the appropriate pronouns and asking what kind of names that they prefer to be called all throughout their care and to incorporate, again, another challenge also is with the software, with our electronic oh, medical yeah. records, because right now I have heard of some published data that there are software out there that there are drop-down menus on either if they are in transition, where are they at, are they in a hormonal phase, are they hmm. on the sex reassignment surgery phase, or are they only just starting and they are just on the cross-dressing or yeah. the dressing part of what society conforms with, with the gender that they are Um, identifying with. Now, Monty, I know, and we'll ask you in just one second, um, you know, through the NHS, there are policies, there are some guidelines that um, are available through um, your national healthcare healthcare service. Before we do that, Jose, are there anything, is there anything like that within the U.S.? I mean, is there any published guidelines from Medicare or Medicaid or um, any other societies? With the ANA, we are working on a white paper because the policies and procedures that are available are very sporadic. And even in my community hospital, there's no policy and procedure. I ask about our, uh, with our nursing organization down there, and there is no set policy. So I think what we, what my next step after the publication of the best practices would be to get those policies in place and get a template out there like a white paper and give it to the community for use. Yeah. But um, to answer your question, I, uh, there's none. That's why we're trying to get the, everyone educated and be yeah. on the same page with best practices. I'm surprised there's no like ARN or any other nursing um, communities that have anything out there. No, uh, there was um, a published article by Tolinch and colleagues in 2018 for perioperative care of transgender patient. Mm-hmm. And I believe this is with the uh, um, analgesia mm, um, journal. Yes. Yeah. And... Um, I believe there are some out there. Yeah. You have to dig for it. Yeah. Really, it's not on the mainstream mm-hmm. media like we think it would, it should be. Yeah. But um, I will continue to research. Yeah. Monty, so tell us what you have found in, or what are in the guidelines for the NHS. Well, I, I think there is, we'll put the link in, but the National yeah. Health Service has what I think is a very useful set of summary pages on the website, which includes the legal status, so the gender uh, the Gender Act of 2004 is in there, which is when there are certain legal changes with regards to the – you can, for example, apply for a certificate of making of making transitions. So there's a legal construct oh. around it. But also in there is just simple things like which terms we use. So the yeah. summary term they chose was gender dysphoria, mm-hmm. recognizing the fact that it's both physical but predominantly mental uh, from the point of view of uh, the – it's the how you feel – is an important mm-hmm. component of where which which track you choose next, and at the front end, it just that simple definition. It says gender gender dysphoria is a condition, 
it's important he says it recognizes a condition where a person experiences discomfort or distress because there's a mismatch between their biological sex and gender identity. It's sometimes known as gender incongruence. And then it goes on to say that it's the choice of the patient. So there's a need to demonstrate the fact that there are psychological issues, but also hormonal issues. And then there are different support systems and options and that hormonal transition, plus or minus the final surgical transition from male to female or female to male. But we sort of pretty much stopped chattering about it now. We're not, it's, it's not one of those sort of uncomfortable things to, to talk about. Maybe, uh, maybe, in your you faci- the maybe your yeah. facility, yeah. Um, but I, from my own personal sp- experience in Kentucky, it's much like yours in Naples. Um, I mean, we've take, I've taken care of patients um, along the way, not in any kind of transition, transitional surgery, but again, for colonoscopies and, and routine kind of uh, care. Um, and, you know, it's still for me, I mean, being in kind of, you know, K- Kentucky, I mean, I feel like there's still a lot of um, unknown. People just don't understand it. Um, and, you know, and, and disrespect, I think, for it. So um, I, I wish we were a little bit further down the line, but maybe this is one of the conversations that's going to help us get there, right, Jose? <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, there's a lot of mistrust with the care of the transgender individuals mm-hmm. because of the marginalization and the whispering that go, that happens behind yeah. um, their care. And I do think that this conversation will catapult into more of an awareness yeah. with everyone so that we can all be addressing them as individuals and not as people who made the wrong choice yeah. like or against a religious belief that we um, do believe in and that it that we can just address them as individuals who need care. Yeah, right, just like we would in, you know, anyone else. I mean, I feel like as far you mentioned the the LGTB, can you talk Mm -hmm. um, Say that out. (laughs) Because there are a lot of different letters, so I want to make sure that we understand what those are. So the LGBTQIA is the, um, I don't know if they're, yes, they are an organization, and it's with the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual. Okay. um, With the acronym. And um, the push for that is for acceptance Mm -hmm. um, with the community, for awareness. Uh, I am a member of the LGBTQIA community, and I have a husband. And um, we have two kids, and I do think that um, sometimes we get the looks when we go to airports, mm-hmm. and I'm daddy and he's papa, so <laughs> I feel the marginalization, and yeah. just imagine that magnifying on a level with a transgender patient that looks halfway through the transition, or probably not even halfway with anything but close to just dressing the part of the yeah. gender um, identity that they are matching with their own self, so... Yeah. It's it's very sad, and the, the marginalization actually is um, actually goes back down to like how willing are we to provide for care as clinical practitioners? Yeah, there is a study out there that I would like to mention. It was it was published in 2018. This was part of the articles that were embargoed, actually, and I was invited to. Oh, I know it's an, it was interesting. It was my first type, and I'm like, I have to like Google what embargo means. I mean, I knew what it meant, but I'm like, <laughs> why is the study? Mm, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, because it, because it was a very sensitive topic. Oh, okay. So, but it was released in um, November, December of 2018, and it was done by Shares and colleagues. It is a study in a Midwest health system where 53 percent of the practitioners were surveyed and asked if they are willing to care for transgender patients, and 53 percent of them already do. But the biggest barriers that were tackled with this study is of lack of familiarity with transition care guidelines, lack of training in transition-specific care, these are all quoted, lack of exposure to transgender patients, and lack of knowledge about transgender with all personnel. So it's all everything from like what I said earlier, like the security guard going to the receptionist, going to the unit aide, and then the physical therapist throughout the continuum of care. So that in that is the suggestion, the fact that in the USA, legally, you're allowed to discriminate. Because in the UK now, there are, it, it is illegal to discriminate. It, so you can't, you can't, as a carer, you can't express a choice to look after somebody or not. That's discrimination. And if you do pursue that, you'll be subject to the full force of the law because it's, it's a crime to, to discriminate. I don't know about the full force of the law, but I have seen people refuse based yeah. on their religious preference or what their beliefs are. 
And they... Are you allowed to not look after Catholics? Or? Uh, no. <laughs> I do. As I'm saying, I say that as a Catholic. I was there. <laughs> Me too. A Catholic too. I know. <laughs> no, but I, but I think there are... There, I have worked with um, physicians uh, and anesthesia providers that won't care for any surgery that um, is um, considered an abortion um, yes. in that specific instance, even if it's something that is, you know... Sterilization. Um, yeah, sterilization procedures. Um, attempted mm-hmm. suicide even for our... Yeah. Um, Prisoners who are yeah. already on the row. Cubs fans. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, well, but but I, I mean, I think we're. I think you are allowed to. To uh, I mean, I don't think you. You can refuse as long as there's alternative care. Yes. Provided if yes. there's no alternative care, then they have to seek care somewhere else. Yeah. And of course, you have to state your reason publicly. It's not because of oh, I don't really like this individual because that would certainly be discrimination. Yeah. So that's why with the education process that what we're doing, I think the best thing to ask ourselves is not, are we going to be educated? But the real question is, are we ready to be educated? Mm -hmm. Because if we are not ready, there's no learning that's going to occur. And the proficiency and the competency level of all the providers across the board is not going to happen. They're just going to do whatever they want to do, and it's not going to trickle down. So the entire system that we usually need, not usually, all the time need a team to perform, yeah. it's going to be a little bit dysfunctional, and then the outcomes would be poorer as opposed to if the entire team are on the same page, on board, and are educated, proficient, and competent, and are willing to be educated. So, for me, in your article uh, articles, there, there are issues that, with regards to general education. In other words, we all need to be better informed about all of this. There are issues with regards to Becoming more comfortable with saying to somebody, what would you like to be called? Do you, do you now want to say he or she? Mm-hmm. But then there are specific issues related to where they are in the treatment pathway. So are there any specific you know, hormonal therapy issues that everyone should be more aware of? Well, perioperatively, the, um, there are published studies that say that there are no um, adverse events or outcomes that come with hormonal replacement therapy. But there are anecdotal evidence out there that um, other um, centers are using, like in Boston, they stop androgen treatment for female to male therapy two weeks prior because they wake up like teenagers. So they got that same delirium. They got that. They want to punch you because of the testosterone. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's a little too much. So they want to wean it out or down so that when they wake up, it's good. The other um, aspect of care that um, is related to hormone would be the use of Sugamidex. Mm. If they still have the reproductive parts, they need to be advised as sensitive the conversation is from female Mm. to male, that if they still have the reproductive parts, they need to cease from any, not any, but, you know, reproductive actions because Mm -hmm. it is, they, they might get pregnant. Yeah, if they're taking. What about any issues with estrogen or or um, some of the female hormones with um, uh, clotting and um, you know, DVTs and things like that? Is that it is. Yeah. It is published. Yes, mm-hmm. they need to go with their usual protocol, all prophylactic medicine um, with sub Q heparin or Lovenox. Sorry, I'm using trademarks, yeah. <laughs> trade names, <Yeah. laughs> and or sequential stockings. The same protocol that we use for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, who are in at high risk for venous thromboembolism intra-op. Okay. And then um, as far as um, some of the recommendations from your paper that you have for us as care providers and, and how we um, how we do take care of these patients and be sensitive to their needs, what are some you know, top three of, of um, recommendations that you have for providers? I think we already do the number one with everyone. Like when I go to my patient, I introduce myself and then I ask them, What's your name? Of course, the two identifiers that we are required to do for um, proper identification of our patients and then the birth date. And then I go back to their name. So I see that you have two names. Which one would you prefer? Mm -hmm. Because some of our colleagues, like I went with Delphin when I first came Mm -hmm. here in the United States in 2000. That's my second name. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why I did that. But then that was like a preferred name. Like everybody who I knew then, they called me Delphin. But Mm -hmm. all my life, I'm Jose. We need to just ask like their second name. Some people even do with their abbreviation. So we already do that. So it's number one when we care for any individual across the board. So at least that's going to be easier to do because mm-hmm. the transition is not going to be like, oh, I need to do this special thing for someone because that's what they want. Am I going to cater for them just because? Now what am I going to do with the other sectors of our population? I'm going to cater for everyone, and that's going to be 
a topic for a different discussion, but I guess the answer is yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. And aside from that, the number two question would be, uh, I mean, the number two thing that we really need to dive into is ourselves. Mm-hmm. What are our beliefs? You know, um, I've been to CRNA and SRNA Facebook page, and there was a talk about pregnancy testing. Mm-hmm. And what should they do? Do they still have the parts is number one question. Uh, if they do, then they need to be tested. It is, mm-hmm. we are liable. Yeah. But we, we, we need to figure out how to have that conversation with our patient exactly. in a sensitive way. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Respectful, yeah. sensitive. I always tell my patients, I'm sorry. I have seen patients that I have said like, oh, we can't do your procedure. I know you're 52 years old, but honey, you're pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't. Shock. I know yeah. it came as a shock. And she's like, there's no way. And I'm like, well, it is. It <laughs> shows it. We can do the blood test to test it more. Yeah. <laughs> but oh then. Gosh. Yeah, so that is one of the things that we need to be sensitive about is to really dig deep and how do we want to be treated as individual, which translates to the golden rule, Yeah, right? Absolutely. How do you want to be is what we want to be treated by others. Yeah. One other aspect that I, that I saw in the article that I thought was interesting and, and had to deal with this myself, but it could be like legally part of um, you have, they have to sign um, or you have to make sure that you ask the patient about this before surgery is if they have any type of equipment or binding or, you know, prosthesis and things like that. And what are the guidelines for that right now? Because if you don't ask to remove that and make that part of the documentation, then you could be held liable for that. Oh, definitely. So yes. Um, assault battery can come into play depending on how much you offend the individual. Mm-hmm. But yeah, external body contour shaping, gender expression, equipment or paraphernalia. It's mm-hmm. law. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come in different shapes and forms. There's breast binding or padding, depending on what transition phase they're at, from male to female or female to male. There could be genital tucking. There's penile prosthesis also. Um, padding hips and buttocks can also be um, a few of the gender expression paraphernalia or equipment that they use. And it could be a challenge for us providers because there could be open wounds or sores mm-hmm. that are there that they could be hiding also. So I do think that we need to ask the question as is to, mm-hmm. to tell them that we are doing this to provide you with the safest care. Because if I don't know, I would not be able to do the safest care for you as much as I can as your anesthesia provider. Yeah. So I, I just think that's a really Im- important part. Um, well, Jose, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Um, we really ap- appreciate it. It was a great conversation. I think this is really going to help open up more conversations to come um, about sensitive, just sensitive topics in general that we need to be talking about as healthcare providers, not just anesthesia providers. Um, so we really appreciate you taking the time and, and sitting down with us. Sounds like we should do a mini series on it. We should do a mini series on yeah. it. There are, there are a lot of different topics that we can talk about, especially in the diversity and in mm-hmm. inclusion aspect of, of healthcare care in general. So um, hopefully we can have you again on the on the show. I would love to. Thank you, Desiree. Yeah, thank great you. to meet you. Thank you and for your work. Thank yeah, you for this opportunity. We really appreciate it. Good luck with everything that you're doing. Um, and if we can help you in any way, let us know. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Thanks for listening. Top Bed Talk. Nick Majerison here. Have you got yourself onto edpom.org yet? If not, you might not be aware Edpom Chicago. Tickets are free for a limited period only. Go now to edpom.org, evidence-based perioperative medicine, edpom.org.